Hey everybody, today we have a very special episode. It's a website deep dive case study, just like the ones that you love. It's going to be incredible. I'm sitting down with Will. Will is a designer from San Francisco. He used to work at Google until recently, where he went on his own to become a web designer and he's doing super great. He's gonna go over with us on one of his recent projects. We're gonna talk about everything from strategy, wireframes, visual design development. You're gonna love this, so enjoy this video. Hey everybody, and welcome to a super interesting deep dive on a web design. We're gonna go with Will here, super talented designer, developer, and he's gonna go through everything that went happen in this really interesting project. So Will, let's get started. Give us kind of an intro to what this project is, who the client is, and what you were trying to achieve with this web design. Absolutely, Ren. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Thanks awesome. for hosting us in your beautiful house. Mi casa es tu casa. <laughs> nice. Great. So this is a Webflow project. So they reached out to me because they wanted a brand new website designed and built in Webflow. Got it. And so before we go into the actual final result here, we're actually going to talk about how we got to this and then reverse engineer it. So at a very high level, the company is called SoFar Ocean. And what they do is they build connected oceans through hardware and software technology. So if we look at the actual beginning building blocks of any website or any digital product. Wait, wait, wait. Can I interrupt? Yeah. So I pretty much understood what the company is about, but why would they need a new website or why um, would they approach you? Like, did they have a previous website or what was the reason for the project? Good question. So the website that they were currently working with was great. It was functional. It did what it needed to do from an aesthetic standpoint. But from a user experience standpoint, it felt short of what their goals were. And so what they hired me to do was to come up with a new strategy, essentially a new way to highlight their product. Okay. Yeah. Got it. All right. So how'd you get started? Yeah, absolutely. So essentially what we ended up doing, Chris and I, the, the actually he's the marketing manager, the director level, um, C level guy who was my direct point of contact. He came up to me and he said, Hey, here are the things that we're struggling with. Here's what success looks like. And of course I had to open up with him and say, Hey, you know, we can make your website more beautiful. Um, but is that actually going to return the results that you actually want? Like, what is the ROI? Because we can hire someone more junior to make it more pretty. Right? Yeah. So I needed to understand what the business value of it one year out was going to be for that client. And did they have clear answers for that? Or? They did. Okay. Fortunately, I worked with a professional and I typically like to work with professionals that, you know, know exactly what their end goal is going to be. And if they don't know, we can unpack that together. But I don't like to start projects unless we can define what success looks like. Do you do that as kind of a strategy session? Do you do that before you kind of send out proposals or only once you they've kind of hired you, then you go out to figure this out? I usually do that before. Okay. Because if I can't, if I can't imagine myself doing this job for them and defining what, you know, the next three months are going to look like, then it's going to be really difficult for us to work together. Got it. All yeah. right. So what was success in this specific project? Absolutely. So they were coming up with a couple new product lines. And so they said, okay, we're doing a new product line for sure. A couple new product lines, but we also want to take what we currently have and then elevate the current products. Because as the site stood before, it was very difficult to, you know, highlight or learn more about the product itself. Got it. All right. So they've hired you. You understand kind of the goals. How do you get started? Sure. So typically whenever I get my hands into a project, the client and I have already defined that, you know, you're the right guy. Here are the things that you're going to do. I don't like to take on projects that I don't know for a fact that I can deliver on the expectation set by the client. And so the expectation for the client was, well, I know you're a UX designer and I want you to work on the whole new reimagined like architecture of our site from beginning all the way to the end. That's not visual. It's actually not Webflow related at all. It's mostly about what buckets go where. Okay. So that way the user's mental model matches that. So how do you do that? Sure. So we essentially what we ended up doing is we started out with a sitemap. Okay. And typically that's the way that I like to start because once we define the sitemap, we kind of know exactly what we're trying to do at a 10,000 foot view. 
So it's kind of like building a home, right? We know that we have a bathroom. We, ha we know we have two bedrooms. What's in the bedroom? We know the bedroom has two closets or it has a bathroom. That's kind of the idea here. And so this metaphorically speaking is like the blueprint of a home. So do you, do you come up with this together with them? Do you do this and then present it to them? How has this come to be to, to happen? Depends on the client. Sometimes they have it already. Okay. Sometimes I have to do it for them. Okay. And so in this case, what we ended up doing is once we had the site map together, we kind of collaborated and said, you know, what if we did this instead of what we currently have? So meaning what if instead of doing static pages, we can leverage Webflow CMS, which is extremely powerful. And what that does from, from a client's perspective is that they can focus less on building new pages and building more content. Okay. Got it. Right. Okay. So you're showing, I can see that you're working within Figma. Did yeah. you create this thing with Figma or did you just use it to collaborate on, I can see comments here or what's going on? Yeah. Here? Yeah. So the reason why I'm showing this to you here is because this to me is one of the most meaningful um, experiences while working with me. It's clear communication from the very beginning all the way to the end. And so as you can see here, once we define the site map, there was a discussion around, okay, let's dig deeper. You know, what is the CMS collection actually doing here? What are the edge case, right? Um, edge cases, because there's usually more than one. And then from here, we can unpack the project a little bit more. And this is the part of the communication and strategy that I was referring to earlier. Okay, so let me see if I got this right. You've kind of brainstormed this structure together. Mm -hmm. You went ahead and put it together visually and send it over in Figma so that you can guys start a discussion on this and, and comment. Yeah. This, this, by the way, I didn't ask this project was done remotely or is it you're based in, in California? Where is the uh, client based in? The client is in California as well okay. in San Francisco. Okay. Got it. So you were working face to face or remotely or how all remote work? All remote. Yeah. Oh, got it. Okay. Yeah, so essentially what ended up happening is when I create a project with the clients, with a potential customer, I say, here's a link. From this moment until the very end of the project, all you have to do is click on this link and you'll never wonder where you are. Where everything, we are. everything happens within Figma? Yep. Okay, got it. All the documentation, all of the low fidelity designs, high fidelity designs, all within Figma. All right, so you have this base structure for the website. Do you, at some point, get an approval for it? How do you know that this step is done and, and you can move to the next step? Right. So this to me is a clear indicator that we're doing things right. So if something is documented and we're saying we're going to move forward in this direction, now there's a clear anchor in the ground that says this is a stamp of approval. We're ready to go into the next phase. And so I work in phases with clients. Okay. Um, as they say, guesses make messes and professionals have a system or a process that they follow. This is the first step, 10,000 foot view. The next step, which this is what's helping us move into the next step is, you know, the low fidelity based off information architecture and the taxonomy of the information and how everything will live together. So we don't- and by that, you mean wireframes? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Basically saying, okay, you know, we have a homepage, but what's going to go on the homepage? It's not so critical to get into that here. Okay. But we right. do need to know the technical aspects of, you know, what we're doing here. And at what point do you kind of align on the visual direction? I saw that you have here a board for inspiration. At what point does that come into the discussion? Yeah, good question. So immediately after I've kind of architected the system, the 10,000 foot view, what I like to do is say, okay, well, now that we have a clear direction on scope of work, let's talk through what, what inspires you as a company? What are the sites that you love? internally that you're like, oh, this site, this company does it so well. It can you ask them to send you references uh, or, I, or you bring them on the table? I do both. Okay. Got yeah, it. because it's, it's naive to assume that you as a designer have all the answers. At times the client may say, hey, like we know the look and feel and the client knows themselves better than I ever will. Yeah. And so they kind of shed light on that. Got it. Yeah. All and, right. And so that's what this is. Uh, they kind of put together a list of, you know, websites and customers. Like, for example, here's an indicator of, you know, an underground mechanical object that, you know, has text on the right hand side. While we didn't copy this, it was enough for me to influence, you know, the next step, which is the, lo the low fidelity design, essentially. Right. Got it. All right. Yeah. Okay. So what else do you 
do you take on from this inspiration? Is it colors? Is it, you know, typography, the visual types? What do you use this for? That's a really good question. All of that. So <laughs> okay. all of that. Um, so to me, the way that I look at design, it's, it's a language, especially visual design, and it communicates an emotion at the end of the day. So whenever someone looks at this screenshot, for example, does it communicate enterprise or does it communicate consumer? consumer-based products like these are the types of discussions that you should have and so they wanted to move away from like you know these types of like abstract shapes over in the corner mm -hmm. these are popular but it's not their brand it's not their character the persona that they want to communicate in the market by the way i did not ask you a lot of clients sometimes come up when they come to you they come with a baggage of the the brand language colors and and kind of they, they already have something that they work with. In mm -hmm. this case, did they have something that they wanted you to keep in line with or were you free to do whatever you want? Fortunately for me, I did have a brand guideline. Okay. Yeah, with colors, typography. So it wasn't a complete redesign of their brand, um, but it was, uh, it was the type of thing that was flexible. They weren't so stuck on their current brand. Got it. Yeah. Okay, that sounds ideal. Yeah. All right. Yeah, and you know, one more thing I like to point out, during these early steps, I like to talk to the client about, you know, how do you imagine this relationship to work well? Um, and typically I ask questions like, do you want to be the person that tells me what to do? Or do you want me to be the person that decides everything? Is that, does that go before you get started with the relationship? Before you... That goes yeah. during the visual design, because visual design okay. is so subjective. I can create a, a, a user experience that is amazing okay and we can associate a number to that this site converts x amount of users more or people were able to find the information 10 times faster than they were based off the previous design but aesthetics is more of a, an acquired taste okay right yeah. and so for that you have to be able to say you know i don't want to step on your toes if you know exactly what you want let me know okay. and, and we can figure it out got it so what was the relationship like in this case? It was definitely a mutual agreement that we were going to do both. Okay. A little bit of both. Got it. They know that I'm the professional, but they know that they have a vision. And, you know, typically that's the right way to go. Okay. So what were the main takeaways from this inspiration phase? I mean, you, you talked about mm -hmm. not using those little abstract shapes or right. types of decoration. What, what were they excited about? Or what did they say? Yes, this is what we want to go with. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, there's no project that's perfect. And I'll be honest with you, there was a little bit of friction during this phase because some of the inspiration that I pulled together was not in line with what they wanted to do moving forward as a company. Okay. And that's totally fine. That's part of the process. For sure. Right. And so what they came back to me and said was, you know, these are great, but it's too animated. It's... um it doesn't communicate, you know, sophistication in a way that we're trying to do. And it's, it's really about the core value of the company. They want it to go more enterprise. And something like this, as it is, you know, a visual designer might look at this and say, this is amazing, this is a great aesthetic. It didn't, in, it didn't go in line with what their goals were. And you have to respect that as a designer. Got it, okay. Yeah. So did you end up having a reference for what they were looking for or did they come up with something? Yeah, so they sent me several examples of sites that currently exist in the market. And while I'm not someone to copy, I did get influence from these sites. Got it. All right. Yeah. Okay, so what's the next steps? You've got this yeah. covered. You have the site map. How do you get on to the next step to the wireframes? What happens there? For sure. So very quickly, once we kind of defined, you know, here's the idea around um, potential looks and feels that we can do here then I like to go very, very quickly into the actual components, the building blocks. And typically I like to start with typography. The main reason why is because clearly, you know, web design or design in general, um, as a profession, design is trying to sell things or trying to make things more easier for the user. And a huge part of that is communication. Yeah. Communication falls down to, I mean, at the lowest level, communication is typography. How do you communicate some, and you know, everyone understands that you look at a big headline, clearly you know what the company does, right? And so that's why I start with typography and make sure that that's in line. Got it, okay. But, but this is, I mean, 
to me, it looks a little bit out of context. Mm. Like, how do you know that this is good versus something else? I mean, you said that mm -hmm. font-wise, like they had something to work with. Mm. So how can you, I mean, how, how do you know that this is good right. at this point? Yeah, sure. So different ways to explain this. So one of the most important ones is search engine optimization. What are the headlines, right? Or going a little bit further from an, an accessibility standpoint, clearly a screen reader, when someone uses that who has a visual impairment, they're gonna tab through, or they're gonna use certain keyboard shortcuts that allow you to only focus on the headlines. Mm. And from, from and a person who has that type of perspective while navigating a website, that's how they use the site. And so it was very important for me to define from an accessibility standpoint first, what are the headlines? And how do we communicate that with different visual hierarchy? The font has to be smaller, larger. And so these I would consider the building blocks from an SEO accessibility and purely communication standpoint. Got it. All yeah. right. So the Good wireframes. <laughs> well, the wireframes. Yeah. Let's do it. Let's do it. What's going on? Wow, this looks intense. There are quite a bit of wireframes here. Let me get out of the actual commenting here and let's go straight into, to me, what a wireframe is All and, right. and what it should convey. So while I do appreciate paper prototypes or paper wireframes, I've learned that not all clients understand what that means whenever you have a, you know, a square. And so what I try to do is I try to get closer to the high fidelity uh, while still maintaining, you know, a clear balance of, you know, this is not an image. This is going to be an image at some point, but it's not. Got These it. are just gray shapes. Okay. And so what that allows us to do here is really focus on the navigation layer, which we talked about during the site map, right? And so one thing, as I mentioned earlier in the conversation, they had this idea to bring in, you know, two more products. And the idea here is that that's great, but how do we highlight it? How do we make it accessible for whoever is landing on the site? And so instead of going with this solution, which is data and hardware, we decided to go with data and hardware under a products tab. And that made the most sense from a hierarchy standpoint, from a business side. What can you, because I'm not super familiar with the product, it's, mm -hmm. with the product and the company, why did you make this decision? Why was that better? Absolutely. Or so for example, let's say you hover over data with the solution. Yeah. Now you're only seeing data and this solution. When you hover over hardware, now you're only seeing hardware. Why not just have a solution where when someone hovers got over it, got product, it. Okay. they know so exactly what it is. By data, you mean solutions that are related to data? Correct. Got it. Okay. So I think it's much clearer when it's under the title of product because otherwise data for me, that's a little bit out of context. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Okay but at least we can kind of create these two solutions that made the most sense. Um, Did you show yeah. them both and have a discussion about this? Absolutely. What's the process like? Okay. Got it. Yeah, we, have a, we had a lot of discussion around this because essentially this is how someone will navigate their site, right? And find the right information. Okay, cool. So moving on from, you know, obviously from the navigation layer, you also have to have the footer. Um, and we tried different solutions for the footer. One that made the most sense was this one. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing that they really wanted to highlight was the sign up for newsletter. Got it. They wanted to get more people in there. And while we could have moved this down to the bottom, I figured, you know, we read from left to right, unless you're from Israel and you read from right to left. Um, so I figured, you know, might as well do the branding on the left and then immediately hit them with a call to action to keep the people in the loop, right? Yeah, makes sense. Um, but yeah, that wasn't the first option that we explored. This was another option. Mm -hmm. This one was a bit aggressive in terms of, you know. The call to action. Yeah, the call to action was a bit aggressive and it's also very cramped. So the solution made the most sense for them. Mm, that's great. Yeah. I love it that you always show, do you always show two options or sometimes even more than two options? Yeah, sometimes I show three, sometimes I show five, depending on the complexity of the, okay. uh, the work. Got it. I think like two options is, easy to kind of grasp. So it's really easy to see this versus that, where the key benefits are or where, I mean, I feel that when I show too many things, they might get lost within too many options. Um, yeah. But this is very clear to me. When awesome. you do wireframes for pages like the homepage um, and stuff like that, what is, 
your process for for that? Do you actually write the copy, or can we go over the homepage? Or yeah, actually, that's probably the best uh, transition here. So I don't write copy. Okay. Yeah. Typically, the people that I work with are either founders of the company or some kind of marketing manager who has a dedicated copywriter in house. Got it. Yeah. And while I do like to write copy. Um, don't get me wrong, that is part of what I can offer. I've learned that, going back to what I said about the company, the company knows who they are way better than I ever will. And so I give that, that ability to really, you know, architect that language. Um, but so yeah. are the content writers part of the process or they're, they're joining later on only in the development? What, what, at what stage do real content goes into play? Such a great question. I've worked with copywriters that say, give me the design and then I will create content for that design. And typically, I don't like to go in that direction, mostly because the copy, the information is critical. That's, the, that's what design is, right? The communication aspect of it. And then we can figure out the best way to tell that story. So you don't go into a, a film and then start recording, right? You right. have a blueprint, right? you have the actual script and then we shoot the film. So I try to communicate that early on because design is intentional. And if I don't have the copy or if I don't know what they're trying to communicate, it becomes art. And I'm not an artist, I'm a designer. Okay, <laughs> so do, you, do are they sh kind of um, shared, like are, are they watching the, the, um, the wireframes and participating? Like how, how does that collaboration looks like? Exactly, yeah. So I give them access to Figma okay. and sometimes they'll just say, hey, like, I don't know exactly what the design will be, but here's this thing and, and you know, I'm, I'm just trying to communicate it visually. You know, the reason why I love Figma so much and I'll show you, um, I actually work with this gentleman, the, the guy at SoFar Ocean, and he didn't go as far as creating designs, but he actually went as far as putting his thoughts in a visual way on the okay. canvas. And so as you can see here, this isn't visual design, it's information architecture. And this is important. This is the step that I'm talking about. Got it. So you can use those con these, this type of content to copy and, and use it within your wireframes or, yeah. or helps you structure the content? Correct. Got it. It gives me- And this, insight. your client did this within Figma? Yeah. That's pretty cool. That's yeah. great. Yeah, he was, he was a really great partner. And we had a very tight deadline, which was, you know, it's admirable that we were able to get as far as we did between just the two of us. Yeah, that's cool. All right, so back to the wireframes. Yeah. Um, do you sh do you do also multiple versions mm -hmm. of pages like you showed us for the footer and the header? Like how how deep do you go in yeah. exploring different different options? Yeah. So typically, what I like to do during these phases is define what the problems are with the current solution that they have. And one of the things that they mentioned is people drop off. People don't know where the products are or how to get to the product pages. And so I had an idea. I said, okay, what if we highlighted the products immediately above the fold? And they were like, you know what? That's, that's pretty aggressive, but let's try it. Let's come up with several solutions. So I tried this solution, but then it hid these other two, right? Yeah. So that doesn't make a lot of the sense. The fold is where the, the, so, the gray yeah. line finished? Yeah, it's about that, yeah. like over All right. here. All right. So. Above the fold is, is an old term with like print and magazine. Uh, it basically means what is visible whenever some, someone lands on a homepage. And so with this solution, clearly these two products are yeah. hidden. And then I tried another solution where, you know, the products are a little bit more visible, but you know, this was still not strong enough. So I started moving into this type of direction where all of them are visible at the same time and they're clearly defined by a uh, category. And this solution started moving in the right direction. Mm. Um, and so I started thinking a little bit more and I was like, well, if we just simply say, you know, Trident, Spotter, ASB, and Grid, that doesn't communicate what the product does, right? Right. And so we added a little bit of subtext to further tell that narrative. And we finished it off with the dot, dot, dot. For the people that wanted to learn more, we can, you know, create a, a link that would essentially scroll down into that product view. Got it. Okay, so these actually do not take you to a separate page. They scroll you down into a specific place within the homepage? Correct. Got it. But if you, if you click here, 
yes, it'll scroll down to the to the home page. But if you click on the actual product or anywhere else on the card, it'll take you to that home page of that Got product. It. Got it. Yeah. Okay. I can see that you have the in the press below this. Mm -hmm. And I, I find this really interesting because I feel like a lot of times, you know, there's kind of a common knowledge that you need to get the kind of social proof and that kind of thing immediately at the top or maybe mm -hmm. even above the fold. And I think that's interesting to see that because you understand their strategic goals to highlight their product, you understand that th this needs to be above the press or, or social social proof, even though that's kind of like what a lot of people do by default. So I think that's really interesting to see. Right, exactly. Uh, uh, continue? Uh, yeah, yeah. Sure. So this was really instrumental, but again, these are just concepts, right? So which one did we go with? Um, we ended up going in this direction, mostly because of what we mentioned before. We wanted to highlight the products more. And so I had a discussion with Chris and, you know, obviously the founders of the company were fond of that solution. And then, you know, obviously once we kind of define a direction, it doesn't have to be fixed. We can always change it as we go. But this is kind of the direction that we started to move into. And uh, it worked really well while we were creating all of these low fidelity designs and, you know, highlighting, okay, what, what else can we talk about here? Explore what, you know, what you can do with the product. Um, that was really important because it's not important just to show what the product does, but how are others using it, you know? So that way it can feel like an extension of what you can use it for in the future. Got it. Yeah. This is like what we usually call the benefit section, right? Like what does it help me achieve um, if I use the product, right? Exactly. Got it. Yeah. And so moving further down the page here, these were just concepts at first. Um, clearly, we needed to really focus on the information. Again, low fidelity designs are not about aesthetics. They're mostly about information architecture, making sure that the right information is there. Yeah, but we can see a pretty good layout at this point. I mean, I think this is pretty well laid out, even at that, at that point. Hmm. Yeah. Right. Um, I don't want to zoom in too much into this. Uh, yeah. Did you have any other questions around um, the homepage? Yeah. Or? What's like? What's the next step? How do you turn this into? Do you? By the way, do you also mm -hmm. have a commented discussion around this uh, stage? We do. The wireframe stage. Yeah. We do. Yeah. As you can see here, we kind of go in here, and um, sometimes he'll leave me a comment. So yeah. he'll say, you know, I don't think adding some additional um, or. I uh, do think adding some additional visuals on this yeah. page, you know, would be beneficial. And so what I did was immediately after I added some imagery, right? Yeah. And I agree with that. Before it was it was not visual at all. So this helped communicate that message more. Got it. All right. So how do we move into the next stage? How do you take this and turn it into something beautiful, visually appealing? Right. Yeah. So, I mean, wireframes are great. But as I mentioned before, we have to get to the next phase. There are phases to this thing. And so the next phase is naturally- By the way, quick question. Yeah. I know you guys hate me for interrupting people. That's just like, I'm a bad interviewer. It's okay. Um, do you actually, because um, you mentioned the milestones and the steps mm -hmm. of the project uh, often, do you also kind of divide the payment hmm. in terms of these things? Or it's just like, I know it's, out of line with what we're talking about, but how do you usually structure the payments of your project? Yeah, so it depends on the size of the project. So typically what I do is 25% up front. That means there's a commitment. Yeah. 25% after the third week. Got it. Without, then, without any consideration to what milestone you are, it's just by, by date? Yeah. yeah. Okay, got it. So 25% deposit, 25% after the third week, and then the last 50% once we're done. Okay. Got it. Yeah. All right. Back to the visual. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Uh, so there's a lot here. We won't talk more about, you know, the low fidelity designs. But, you know, as Ron wants to know, how do we then translate this information, which is really what it is, into something that's aesthetically pleasing that further tells that narrative? And so the next phase is the high fidelity phase. The high fidelity phase is my favorite. Uh, no offense to, you know, the web flow process or, you know, the strategy that's always fun too. But man, there's so much joy in making something beautiful, you know? I feel you. I feel you. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And so typically what I do with this is, you know, going back to the wireframes, 
what does that look like? What, what's the color of the hero image? How do we show this information? Um, and then very, very quickly, right, we move into the imagery. What is the essence of the imagery that we're trying to convey? Were you, what type of imagery did you end up working with? Is this mm. stock imagery? Did you have to create something custom? How do you go about doing that? Yeah, for sure. So I had some pushback from the team. They had a set of images that they wanted to use. And so I respected that. Uh, it's in line with their brand and that I don't have they've a problem. created? Images that they've created? That custom they made? Okay. Yeah, that they, that they took. So they probably hired a photographer at some point. Got it. Yeah, for sure. Um, okay, so basically you had the images, you were just um, tasked with what's the best way to present them. Correct. Got it. Yeah. But, you know, before we get into the final result, I like yeah. to show a little bit more about the push and pull that happens. Yeah. Because I don't want to be that designer that says, you know, here's the best thing and here's the final result. No, it's not like that. There are pushbacks. It's all real talk here on this channel. Oh, yeah. No, <laughs> we're, we're going to get real. So... To be honest with you guys, I showed them these solutions and, you know, I thought that this was a clean solution. The logo is in line with their product color uh, or in, in line with their branding color. And they they didn't like it at all. And I was like, oh, no, this is, uh, you know, as a designer, you're in the business of look what I can do. And when you show something that's not fully completed, you're vulnerable, right? Hey, yeah, that's tough. That's tough. It's always painful. Yeah. And. To me, that's, that's the number one thing that I've learned as a designer from working at startups to recently working at Google for the past two years. You have to be comfortable putting yourself in a vulnerable state every single day. It's important. Yeah. So what happened? Yeah. So I showed them a bunch of different solutions like here's another one um, and then here's another option. They didn't like any of these. Oh. And I was like, oh, no. Okay. Back to the drawing board. That's okay. So we very, very quickly within like a couple, maybe like two hours, um, I came up with a ton of different solutions because as a designer, when, when you show something and the client pushes back, you want to immediately show that you're still engaged. You're someone that can take feedback and iterate very quickly. You don't want them thinking, oh no, is this the right person for the job? You know? Yeah. It's tough. Right. So immediately I said, okay, what, what can I do to improve the experience? So they wanted to go with a darker look and feel. That was, that was very clear. And so I thought, okay, what if, what if we had iconography for the products that we have uh, or that they have? Um, and then, you know, leverage some of the imagery that was already persistent on their website. They kind of liked this direction. Um, and they were like, oh, you know, what, what, what if it looked, you know, a little lighter? What if we had white backgrounds with like a gray, you know, background and in the cards to kind of offset the information. We ended up moving completely away because we didn't have the time, honestly, to, to do, create icons. Yeah. yeah, we just didn't have the time. We had, we literally had one month to do the strategy, the low fidelity, high fidelity, and all of the Webflow implementation. Okay, yeah, this would take for me, I think, like three months, uh, sounds like a three months project. So it was one a, month is a tight deadline. It was pretty tight. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so very quickly, we moved away from some of these like, you know, wireframe or more iconography um, based designs into a more realistic like here are some product shots of the product actually in the wildlife. Because again, as we mentioned in the beginning, the whole strategy of this is to surface their products, to get more people involved in learning more about their product. So why would we hide them behind icons? Yeah. Right. All right. And then, you know, from there, it was all about, okay, now that we have the hero section, how do we actually show the product section in the best light? Well, I presented an idea where, you know, you clearly have someone using the product. That's kind of cool. And this is imagery that they already had at this mm -hmm. point? Yeah. Yeah. But I see that you still had uh, icons going on around here. Right. So these are more, I guess, secondary uh, icons more to to offset the the text because do you, you work with um, ready-made icons or do you get them somewhere or you create them yourself what's your yeah what's your I icon strategy <laughs> <laughs> so Mike uh, you know he's a, another youtuber he would tell you I don't like to spend time making icons I just go to an icon pack and you know I use it yeah um, I am the same way yeah. <laughs> yeah same here by the way yeah right right you got it unless yeah. I absolutely have to make something yeah. custom so what's your favorite icon spot? Hmm. Good question. I'm biased because I use material design icons for a long okay. time. 
So I typically leverage material design. Got it. All yeah. right. They have a lot of great icons. All right. So continuing, um, you know, obviously this is an exploration phase of high fidelity solutions. Mm -hmm. um, how do we, you know, define what that product section looks like? And, you know, we went through several solutions and I'm only going to show you a few. Do you share all of these sketches with the client? All of these different iterations? Whenever we're talking about something as important as a product section, yeah. Got it. All right. Yeah. And this is, you know, obviously very, very important to get right. Yeah. So it's important to look at how far can we take this? What is like, you know, as far as we can go to like the, the lowest uh, effort, right? We ended up settling with this solution. Yeah. This was not my favorite. This is another part of being a designer no one talks to you about in school. You know, the client may choose a solution that's not your favorite and that's okay. Sometimes you just, yeah, you know? I think it looks good. I mean, it, it looks really good. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, yeah I, I, you know, after a while it grew on me. Okay. Yeah. Continuing on to the later stages of the high fidelity designs, as you can see here, we're still pulling the same type of essence, which is the dark background, allowing us to use tabs you know, and, and bringing in some of the functionality in mind as we do it as well. Um, so here's another example where we were thinking about the actual technical side a little bit, because, you know, as you can see here, there's an image on the left hand side, and then we have some bullets on the right hand side. With Webflow, you can do things like sticky, right? It's a sticky position where as you scroll, the user doesn't scroll past this image. So the image stays fixed, and I can show you how that would work. But do you communicate that to your client at that point? Um, do you tell them this is going to stick when we scroll down or? Yeah. Yeah. All yeah. right. So during those phases where it's hard to communicate it without actually building it out, I like to tell the client, hey, you know, this is something cool that we can do. I know this isn't, you know, something that you told me we should do or something that, you know, is super popular, but we can do it. What do you think? Um, and that's, that's kind of how I like to work. I'm, I'm not an order taker. Got it. When it comes to visual, um, mobile responsive versions mm -hmm. and stuff like that, do you actually design them out in Figma as well? Do you just implement them in Webflow? What's your process for that? Yeah, so I don't design uh, tablet or mobile designs. As a designer, once you do this enough, you can, as you're designing this, in your mind, you can unpack what that'll look like. Yeah, and I feel the same way. Yeah, and you know, while I'm doing the web uh, implementation in Webflow, in my mind, I'm already 10 steps ahead. I know how this is going to cascade. I know the percentage of the container. So it's gonna be flexible. This is going to collapse into a smaller view. Uh, you know, conversely speaking, the same thing for this. This is two columns at the moment, but the smaller the screen gets, it'll just wrap, right? And using Flexbox, it becomes extremely easy to get that type of behavior. So how about we jump into the implementation? Can you show us how this was built out and what was the structure for dynamic content? How, how did that look like in Webflow? Absolutely. This is another one of my favorite parts, by the way. Uh, Webflow is amazing if you guys aren't already using it. Uh, you need to hop on Webflow. Um, I didn't get him to say this, he just said it. <laughs> By the way, I've been using Webflow since 2014 or so, and I've been on the Webflow Experts program since, uh, gosh, two years ago. So I'm, I'm all in on Webflow. Got it. All right, show us, <laughs> show us how this looks like. Yeah, for I sure. I love to start with talking about the database, the collection view. Like, do you also structure that before you get started with the visual side, or do you just start, like, what's your process for, for building in Webflow? Yeah, good, good question. The database and the information, going back to what I said before, is the most important thing. So I like to start with that architecture first. Okay. Um, I was fortunate enough to not have to build the backend okay. um, from scratch. They already had a team who worked in Webflow. Oh, that's um, amazing. Yeah. Help. Their old website was in Webflow? Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, so they were already familiar with Webflow. So they said, here are the current backend solutions we want to do more stuff with it, more sophisticated filtering. Can you add more logic to it? And so what I did is I, you know, similar to a developer, you may not start from scratch. You may use a framework that already exists and then add on top of it. So technically speaking, did you worked on their existing project within Webflow? You did not create a new project? 
I did create a new project, but I still kept the back end. Everything else was swiped clean. Got it. Okay. Yeah. So you you imported um, the the items, the CMS items. Is that how it worked, or? So I duplicated the project Got and then it. deleted oh. all of the pages. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. Okay. Got it. it. It was a very unique experience. I'm not used to doing that. I'm used to the, being the person that you know builds everything from the very beginning all the way to the end until launch. Got it. Um, okay, that's interesting. Yeah, I was fortunate though. The developer that worked on this was is really smart, knows Webflow really well. So thank you. I actually met him at the No Code Conference. Oh, His really? name is Matias. I'm Matias. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. All right. So, so show us how this works. Cool. So. I don't know how technical you guys are in terms of you know the CMS collections here, but um, when, so just a quick recap: if you're not a Webflow user, or um, collections is basically the kind of the database for the dynamic content. If you want your clients to be able to add new content themselves or edit things besides just titles, then you create collections, which is basically databases. So as you can see here, they have team team members or or blog posts, which they can just create and add new items to their website themselves. Exactly. Okay. Right. So team members make sense. What is live dives? Live dives are individual, um, basically pages. It's like case studies. Consider them case studies, mm, okay. essentially, where they actually show the live dive of the product being used in the real world setting. So it's not like here's an image of a product. No, they actually take the product and put it under water and show you what it looks like, Got which it. I think is brilliant. So the structure for this is something like a YouTube video mm -hmm. and uh, some links and a thumbnail. Right. Got it. Exactly. And because this site is already live, I'm able to show this to you guys. If it was not, I wouldn't be able to. So um, this is actually live as we speak now, so you can test it. And how long, how many pages are on the website? Oh gosh. Um, Can we check it out? Yeah. Oh man. Oh man. How many pages? There's a lot. Okay. So let's talk about how long it took you to actually implement this and, and actually the whole project. Yeah, for sure. So the entire project from beginning to end was um, four weeks. Four weeks. Four weeks. In That's total. incredible. How, yeah. how was that divided between the different parts of the project? Yeah. So. I was very aggressive about setting definitive deadlines. We have to be done with a low fidelity by this day, or yeah. we're not. Did they be come done. up? Why did you do it so fast? Like what? They, they had, were they were limited. Yeah, so they had a deadline of the twenty seventh um, of October, and so this was it was very critical. They had a, a presentation or a conference to go to, and so it was imperative that they launched a new site with their new branding and everything along with it. So. That was not negotiable. Got it. We had to do it. So in order to do this as a designer, I had to let them know from my previous experience, if we're not done with this phase by this time, it's impossible to hit our goal. And so that's part of a, a consultant's role, which is to create, you know, walls in terms of what's realistic. So that way you can better manage expectations. So how is the project divided? Low fidelity design was about one to two weeks. Uh, during that time, I was also a little bit working on high fidelity because it was very quick. I typically don't do that. I typically do low fidelity than high fidelity. Um, and then the Webflow implementation, I, well, actually, the, the high fidelity implementation was about one week. So low fidelity, two weeks, high fidelity, one week, and then one week for the development. That's incredible. That's incredible. Will, thank you so much. First of all, incredible work. Well done. Congrats on, on a wonderful project. And thank you for being so open and transparent and showing us everything, even the things that didn't end up working. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. See you on the next one. Oh, yeah.